here. All right, the schedule is as follows. All right, um, we're gonna do a check-in, which we, we've done. We're doing a welcome, which I'm doing now. And in a few minutes, I'm going to introduce to you the board chair and the table board president. Then your presentations will take place. And our first group up will be youth education, followed by transportation. Our third presenters uh, will be housing and wrapping it all up will be our, our community resources team. And then we'll conclude with words from um, LCA, a board member and some closing remarks. But before we get started, let me just share a few housekeeping instructions. Keep your videos on mute. Let me go ahead and mute everybody. All right. All right, keep your videos on mute if you are not speaking. And as much as possible, keep your video on so we can stay and get so we can all stay engaged. But if you just happen to if you need to step away to become disengaged, of course, turn turn your video off. Um, LC 2020, if you will, add behind your name, LC 2020, so we can know who the current uh, participants are and our newest, who our newest graduates will be. So just, you can do your first name, comma, LC 2020, or your last name, first and last name, LC 2020. And if you're an LC grad, go ahead and add the year that you completed the program. And if you are a community member that is not a graduate of the program, please add your business or organization so we can know who you are because there are a lot of businesses and organizations in Charlottesville that support Leadership Charlottesville. Each team is going to share their own presentation so they can advance when they are ready and to play their videos when they are ready. Feel free to use the raised hand option if you have a question and feel free to use the applause, the hand clap um, option if you want to applaud your, your teammates. You can post your questions in the chat box or wait until the question and answer segment to do that. And lastly, again, keep your video on as much as possible and because we want everybody to be engaged. But again, if you need to, if you're gonna be fumbling and stumbling doing a whole lot of stuff, just turn it off, make sure you're muted and come back and join us. All right, we're ready everyone? Okay, let's get started. I'd like to introduce to you all um, our chamber president, Elizabeth Cromwell. And I, I wasn't sure if Christine Nardi is on the call, but um, I'll start with Elizabeth. Christine, you're there? I am, I'm okay. here. Great, hey, there you are. Okay, hey. put it on speaker. <laughs> All right, so ladies and gentlemen, Christine Nardi is our chamber board chairwoman and um, she has done a fantastic job leading our organization and I would like to um, allow her to have a few words for you all. Thank you, Andrea, and hello everybody. I'm so excited that I get to bring two parts of my world together today. First, as an enthusiastic chair of the Chamber Board of Directors this year, and second, as the executive director of the Center for Nonprofit Excellence, and for those of you that know c &E, you know that we focus on strengthening nonprofits and community-based organizations so they can do good work better, uh, which is really part of the, the, the topic and the reason that brings you all together here today. So as you well know, as part of the Leadership Charlottesville program, you are called upon to work in teams to come up with viable solutions to various community issues. And I know that we've never done Leadership Charlottesville or community projects like this before in a pandemic, and you've never been called on to lead in a pandemic. As you know, community solutions require understanding of both environmental context in the community and the people in the community. And this health and economic environment that we're faced with has really tilted our world and tilted our community. The inequities that have already existed have really been laid bare and many of our people are more vulnerable than ever. So a grateful and heartfelt thank you to you all for keeping community issues and solutions front and center in your leadership, both through these projects, through Leadership Charlottesville, and most importantly, as you return back to your work and passion, which no doubt will look and feel different for some time to come. So thank you. And good luck today in your presentation. Thank you so much, Madam Chairwoman. We appreciate that and for your support of uh, Leadership Charlottesville. Next up, we have our Chamber President, Elizabeth Cromwell, and this is her second class. She will have an opportunity to speak to at, at um, 
for a year in ceremony. So Elizabeth, I turn it over to you. Well, thank you. Um, and congratulations to all of you. This has been a uh, <clears throat> quite a year, quite a last few months. Um, and I really just want to echo everything that Christine said. Um, the chamber is, is delighted to um, have this program and we're really thrilled that you all were able to be innovative and um, participate in challenging times. And so um, I'm really looking forward to seeing your presentations um, and I really look forward to congratulating you all in person sometime before too long, I hope. So thanks, let's get on with it. All right, thanks Elizabeth. Okay, so we are now going to start the actual presentations. And first up is, let's see, our youth education team. And this team consists of Ty Cooper, Daniel Fairley, Corinne Giller, Rob Gray, Richard Needham, David Puckett, Arthur Rogers, Jimmy Rowland, Derek Rush, Jesse Torrey, and Patton Usry. So I will turn it over to the individual who will be doing the speaking for uh, youth education. Uh, thank you, Andrea, for the intro, and thank you for the chamber uh, and yourself for setting this up and letting us uh, kick off the LC 2020 presentations and, and finally wrap up this program. Seems like it's drug on pretty long uh, with everything. Um, as you mentioned, our group was youth education, and we had a focus on early childhood care uh, in the Charlottesville Albemarle area. And before we get started, uh, I wanted to recognize and thank a few people who were invited to this call. I think I've seen uh, a few of the names already on the list. Um, they were critical in helping us work through this project and provide information and support as we work through, uh, through this entire process. Uh, Barbara Hutchinson and Jacques Landry from the United Way of Greater Charlottesville and Gail Esterman from Ready Kids Charlottesville. Thank you guys very much uh, in helping us complete this project. We couldn't have done it without your support and help. Um, actually, each member of our group put in a lot of time into this project. So we'll actually have a few people that will be speaking and taking turns as we go through the presentation. Um, so again, we'll, we'll kind of toggle through. Um, and as for our agenda, First, we're gonna discuss what is the issue. So we'll talk about the issue that we found that we would like to address. Second, uh, we will discuss what parents had to say. We went around and talked to actual parents of the Charlottesville area and got surveys from them and we have some real-time information from them uh, which helped guide us along the, our, uh, our project. Then we'll introduce what our potential solution was to address the needs that we identified, followed up with how it will be funded. Uh, so at this time, I'm actually going to pass it on to Ty Cooper. Uh, he, he's going to go over the issue that we identified as well as some of his personal work that he's been doing uh, that ties directly into our project. So, Ty. Thank you. Thank you. Um, since 2006, I've traveled the country documenting the factors that make quality pre-K services inaccessible to many in this country. Um, and I discovered issues on the road that really it, it's pretty much, um, it, it's a mirror image of what parents here in our own backyard are suffering from. And, and we'll, go, we'll go through that a little bit later. But so instead of tackling the issues that make quality pre-K inaccessible, because those are issues that we as a group in Leadership Charlottesville cannot possibly solve. Um, that's more of a governmental issue and um, yeah, it's more governmental as well as the actual facilities. So instead of tackling those issues, we decided to try to make things a little easier for parents. And we decided to come up with an, we decided, to, we decided to design an app. And that app will provide parents with a one-stop shop type of um, system that they could put right in the palm of their hands and go through the different filters to figure out which pre-K service available in Charlottesville will be identical, or not identical, but more for their family and it will help their family out when they come down to trying to place their kids with the provider. And, um, but it's one thing when you come up with an idea, you have to go out to find out if that idea is an actual need or if it's just a mirage or something that you come up with and think that it's an idea that can be useful. So to do that, we took the step in um, creating a survey. And with that survey, we took those surveys to different providers in the area. And I directly um, went to the YMCA as well as um, Barry Early Learning Center and drop those off. And I stood there and watched 
watch parents actually fill them out and we had um, conversations. And we had many conversations and it was, the parents were so elated, so ecstatic that this type of app would be available for parents. Although their kids were already situated, they, they did express that they wish they had an app where they can kind of go into and see, okay, um, how, many, um, how many seats are in this one um, daycare or do they accept subsidies or all the other factors that would make life easier for them and, and, and pretty much match their needs. But I'm gonna share one, um, one story, one testimony basically. Uh, my father, um, his family were um, living in Maryland and they, was re they were relocating to Richmond because he had a job in Richmond. So he made a last minute pivot um, to buy a house in Charlottesville, although he had to commute to Richmond. So when he moved to Charlottesville at that last minute, there was no app or anything available for him to really be able to compare and contrast you know, the different um, providers in the area. So he told me that he said he really truly wished that he had an app like this, that it would have been a big help to his family because it was, a, it was a really pain for him to find the place that they end up finding. And um, so we took it to the next step because we did identify the need. And then I'm gonna let Dave kind of um, take you through the next process that we went through um, to actually move things forward. So Dave. Thanks Ty. So one of the things we recognize, uh, although Ty has experience in this area, we recognize that none of us are experts in this field. So we wanted to find a partner to help, help guide our work through this process. Uh, and we were fortunate enough to find those partners in Ready Kids and United Way, as Jimmy mentioned. Uh, they were a wealth of information. Uh, as one example, uh, we learned that the United Way of Lynchburg was working on a similar project. And so we were able to directly connect with them and um, uh, talk about their challenges and successes to date. We also wanted to make sure that, that our project uh, would translate back locally to the region. So as Ty mentioned, we conducted uh, parent surveys in the Charlottesville, Albemarle area uh, to determine the needs of parents and their current knowledge of the available resources. To tell you a little bit about what we found through those uh, surveys, uh, Richard will uh, talk about the results. Thanks, Dave. Um, so we had 175 uh, uh, respondents and uh, these are the results from those surveys, which were both paper, handed out um, in paper format, and also uh, by online. So uh, what ages are we really addressing? So essentially between three months and five years old. So that's that first slide. Let's just keep moving. Um, one, uh, one area that's particularly critical is early care and aftercare. So public schools essentially open uh, from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. and then parents are sort of on their own to, to look for additional support. Uh, so if they have, if they go to work earlier or later, they need that additional support. So we saw that 39% of, of parents said they needed care before 8 a.m. and then 80% needed care after 3 p.m. Next slide. Um, so what's important in terms of information to parents. So the, the critical one is really location. That's gonna be a critical piece in, in helping them get there uh, in time to, to drop off and pick up and so on. The next one's hours of operation, cares of uh, caregivers credentials. And so going on down the line, these are the things that we want to address when we go to build out the app. All right, next one. Okay. and. Um, how did, how did parents, what are they doing right now to find providers? So most people are, are speaking to friends and getting recommendations for them, which is not uncommon. Um, the next one is a website. So clearly parents are using digital tools to find the care that they need. Next slide, please. Okay, so awareness of local childcare resources. So some, some programs will have uh, more of a, a marketing budget and they can get their name out there. Some other services might not have the same um, awareness amongst parents. So again, the app hopefully would, would increase uh, awareness for those uh, smaller programs. All right, and I think that's it for me. So I'm gonna hand it over to Corinne. Yeah, so we decided that a good potential solution would be an 
an application that was easy for parents to use on their phones, um, tablets, whatever you might have, that way it's on hand. Um, should you see kind of an advertisement or something for a daycare somewhere, you could easily access it through this app to kind of see uh, if it was there. And through that, we realized uh, without our survey that there were a lot of things that parents wanted when looking for a daycare or childcare for their children. Um, you know, everything from a different language to, you know, timing, as you saw uh, with Richard's slides. And so through that, we came up with a application that would kind of have all of these things. And so you're seeing the uh, home screen that parents will see when they open up the app right now. And if we go to the next slide, you'll see the map screen. And so this would, um, with some vector facilities by a web designer, um, application designer, sorry, it would show the differences in um, daycare centers, uh, early education centers, as well as home providers. And then also it would show, um, it's not on this particular view of the map, but it will also have a key indicating if it is a child care resource. So, um, you know, child services, things like that, it would also have on there and it would differentiate for parents a way so they could see, um, you know, per perhaps they do want an in-home provider, perhaps they would prefer a uh, larger center. It all, it all works based on the parent's needs and how you would find the um, daycares that work the best for you, you would use uh, the CPR filtering screen. So you would kind of fill out, based on these filters, exactly what you were looking for, everything from how close it is to your home, where you needed it to be, um, et cetera. And then if you wanted you know, extra things, they would be in the additional information. Say you do need transportation. And then say you clicked on your provider. This just so happens to be um, Arthur's life daycare. Uh, but so it tells you what kind it is, where it is. It'll also tell you the provider ratio, which was something that we saw a lot of parents wanted it. So it would have all the information essentially that parents look for in one easy place for them to find. And then you could easily call that provider right there through the app to see, you know, can I fill an application? How does your application process work? Do you have capacity, you know, just to make sure that everything was right on the screen? Um, and so we realized that there are some um, difficulties or challenges that would come up with this. And, you know, how would we get this out there to the public, et cetera? And so I will let Patton take it away with that. Thank you, Corinne. Um, if you can go ahead and go to the next slide for me. So we ran a quick SWOT analysis on this um, just to kind of see what we were working with. Um, the strengths that we found were obviously like Ty talked about, the proven need in the community. Um, there are other apps and resources, but nothing that puts everything in one easy place for parents to access. Um, another strength would be, again, as you can see, everything is very user-friendly, intuitive. That was our main purpose of the app. Um, there are also a broad array of providers in Charlottesville to highlight, so we're not dealing with somewhere out in the boonies where we can't, we don't have content for the app. Um, our weaknesses obviously are going to be cost, um, access and distribution, so we've come up with a plan that'll be on the next slide, um, but that will show different places that we want to put flyers, launch a social media campaign, um, use word of mouth really to get to some of our, our um, parents that don't have access to transportation or uh, technology. Um, and then another weakness, obviously, on that note is the technology learning curve. Um, a lot of us are fortunate enough to know how to use apps and how to download them. Um, we would have to kind of work with some people to, to get them up to, up to board on that. Um, another, so an opportunity would be there's a growing need for this sort of app. And United Way is a really great partner to work with because they have a good reputation and they have a lot of network um, networking in Charlottesville. So our threats would be the ability to maintain the app, which was something we ran into time and time again. Um, we've researched a different, I think three or four different groups that could probably you know, have, a, have a way to maintain it over the next year or two. So we're still trying to figure that out, but we'll get there. 
Um, and then if you can go to the next slide for me. This is a flyer that we came up with. We wanted something that was eye-catching that had just enough information but wasn't overwhelming to people. And then on the left, you'll see a group of places that we thought would be good for broad distribution. So post offices, bus stops, school bulletin boards, um, Region 10, using a lot of our local partners to get the word out. Um, yeah, and then so one of our issues that we talked about was funding, which I will turn it over to Daniel to give a better, a better array of that. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm pretty excited to announce, um, Arthur, you can go to the next slide, that we have found funding. Um, we have found the United Way and actually were able to get a grant to help support the funding and the development of the app, uh, which is pretty exciting because uh, I know that a lot of times uh, LC projects, sometimes you don't know whether or not it's going to happen or maybe it's something that you're kind of worried about like the costs that are associated with it. So we're pretty excited and we're able to find funding and that we're able to get not just the cost estimate, but someone that's able to help fund that cost. Um, so we're looking forward to getting this uh, out and running. I know COVID's gonna be a little bit of a hindrance to, towards that, but we're very excited to see that there's already funding developed and already funding that is dedicated towards this application. And lastly, we just want to know if you all have any questions. I think my question was answered um, about how you're gonna maintain the app, how you're gonna make sure it's updated, the um, providers making sure that they were updated and you said that that was a challenge and something you were working on. I got a question, can I ask? Yes, Alex, go ahead. Okay, uh, good morning and thank you for um, uh, doing this uh, uh, under this uh, COVID environment and congratulations to the class of 2020. Um, I'm glad uh, somebody took up uh, the child care uh, issue because um, when I first moved here, um, my, my wife uh, was uh, offered a job at UVA and uh, believe me, we couldn't get uh, a child care uh, center. It was pretty difficult uh, uh, to find a, a place, you know, to take my daughter. And I was out of the country. And my wife called me and said, look, you know, I think I'm gonna call UVA. That was a week before the day she was supposed to start. Uh, I think I'm gonna call UVA and tell them I will not accept the job, you know, to go ahead and, and hire somebody. So that was because of uh, uh, child care issues. And in particular, kids with disabilities, you know, I uh, would have liked uh, you guys to have touched that area because it's pretty difficult to find a daycare or child care center locally here that can take a uh, kid with a uh, disability. However, we managed to find uh, uh, that particular uh, uh, place and uh, my wife was able to accept the job. Um, the question I have is, uh, were you guys to determine the average cost of child care uh, here uh, in Charlottesville? You know, you an average question? cost of a child care, either per month or, or per day or on an annual basis, what's the average cost? The average cost is about $750, $800 a month is the average cost of daycare. And that's including, um, in-home situations as well, as well as, um, you know, the, um, the ones that have actual facilities out of the home. Okay, thank you very much. And Alex Akafuna, your class of 17? Yes. Okay. 2017, yeah. Thank you for your question. And we'll, we'll take two more and then move to the next group. Teresa had a question on how do you update wait times? Yeah, I, I didn't. I, I did not understand what she meant by the wait time. Wait times for what? Unmute yourself, Teresa. Okay. <laughs> wait times meaning, um, you know, someone wants to place the, their child in the center, but they don't have any openings right now, so they they have a wait time. Um, okay. 
Okay, I understand. We don't we don't provide that on the app. The app is is pretty much just a resource to be able to compare and you know provide comparison and contrast to what's offered in the community. The parents okay. have had to reach out to the um the, the providers and find out you know find that out. But we don't have that information on the website. That would be too much. I mean, on the app, All right? <laughs> to be involved um into um the business of the providers, and we're not here for that. It's just an app to be able to provide information needed. And one, gotcha. and a one-stop shop is what our goal is. Yeah, I thought that would be really difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we're not, we're not going to take. We, we try to do something that has reality to it that we can actually do as a group. Good, thank you. Okay, I'm, um, Gail Esterman. I'm yeah. from Ready Kids and also Leadership Charlottesville class of uh, 2015. So I just wanted to thank the team. This is fantastic. Um, as you all said, much needed. Ready Kids is eager to continue to partner with you on this. Thank you. Thanks, Gail. And thank you all for your questions. And thank you, Team Youth Education, for your presentation. Um, if there are no other questions, we are going to uh, move on to the next presentation, which is transportation. Turn it over to you all. Okay, thank you. Uh, hey everybody, it's Greg. Um, first time presenting on um, Zoom, so uh, bear with me please. Um, I'm guessing I have to present my presentation like this. Does that look everybody good to everybody? Um, I'm guessing I can't hear Andrea, but I'm guessing it looks good. Okay. All right. Thanks. Um, so um, here's our team members. Um, we call ourselves the bus stops, and you might notice that uh, some of our team members are currently riding a bus um, as we speak. Um, so um, we call our project Voices of Transit, and we describe it as a project to deliver community opinions about public transit to local decision makers. And we've done that through creating a uh, short video, which we will show to you at the end. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about how we selected our project, um, how we did the project. Um, I'll describe the project briefly. Um, We'll talk about how we've shared it with the community and um, then we'll watch the video. It's about eight minutes long. So um, as everybody listening probably knows, one of the more challenging steps um, of the team is actually selecting the project, selecting what you're gonna do. Um, we self-selected into the transportation group, but none of us really had a particular project in mind when we did so. Um, and we, we wanted to do something consequential, of course, but we also wanted to choose something we could actually do in the amount of time we had. So um, a lot of constraints. And then um, because none of us had any particular experience in the realm of transportation, um, we started with some research, of course. Um, and we quickly confirmed our suspicion that there were Already a large number of people and organizations um, committed to improving local transportation. Um, you guys probably know that there are three local transit services, CAT, John, and uh, universities system. Each local government has a transportation planning program. So they have people in those organizations working on transportation issues. Um, of course, VDOT is in the mix um, as the, the folks who build and maintain roadways, um, except in the city, of course. Um, and then there's this, uh, this regional body, the Tra Thomas Jefferson Planning District Commission, um, which does the regional transportation coordination and produces documents um, such as these shown, um, one of which is called the Charlottesville Admiral 2045 Long Range Transportation Plan. So um, we realized that uh, this, this world of transportation is pretty complicated. So we started reaching out to who we thought were local experts. And uh, so here's a, a list of some of the people we met with. Um, we met with Brad Sheffield first. He's the CEO of Jaunt. And at the time, we had this idea that we would uh, create an app to help users figure out how to get from point A to point B. And uh, discovered in talking with Brad that um, John is actually working on an upgraded app 
that would actually integrate um, the other transportation systems as well. So um, he did give us some, some good ideas and thoughts and so forth, but uh, we, we recognized or, or learned that um, creating an app um, is already being done. And then we met with this guy, Kyle Irvin, who is uh, fairly new to the community. He's the marketing coordinator for the uh, Charlottesville area transit. And um, at the time, we, we were thinking about a, a kind of a marketing campaign. We were joking about having uh, local celebrities ride buses, but uh, not tell anybody which bus they're on to get people to want to get on a bus to see if they could run into, say, Dave Matthews playing his guitar or something like that. Um, but we learned from Kyle, of course, that um, there were there was actually a, a national uh, annual ride the bus campaign that uh, had just completed when we spoke with Kyle. Um, so we started thinking differently and, and reached out to this guy, Sean Tubbs, who actually works for Piedmont Environmental Council, but is um, personally just kind of like a local advocate for transit. He tweets a lot. He's, he's on other uh, social media a lot. And, and so when we, when we spoke with Sean, we started thinking more and more about um, trying to enhance um, the actual transportation planners and leaders of this area, enhance their knowledge of what's going on out there in the transit world. Um, we certainly recognize that um, organizations do surveys and so forth and so on, but um, we felt like that um, we weren't going to come up with like the problem um, solution ourself of transportation you know what what are the real problems we're not the experts what are what are really gonna, the solutions going to be we're not you know experts but we could certainly better inform the people who are making the decisions um, to to uh, convey what the uh, problems are with the riders of buses for instance and so that's the direction we headed um, so in summary, we realized that there were a lot of people working on this problem. Um, initial ideas had already been tested. Um, so we decided, uh, again, to convey the experience of actual riders um, through these like man on the street video interviews with riders and um, felt like that it would humanize the data um, that they're probably already getting just to kind of hear people directly. Um, so, what, how did we make a video? Um, we, uh, first of all, we reached out to Ty Cooper and Daniel Fairley, who were kind enough to help us with some um, advice about, you know, making videos, the technical logistical aspects, but also other softer things. Uh, so, much appreciated. Thanks, guys, for that. Um, we basically used our personal cell phones to record interviews we did with folks um, that were standing at bus stops. We would obtain their permission to use uh, the videos uh, or their interviews in a video. And then um, we edited the footage using um, software called iMovie. Um, Henry Young, one of our team members, uh, was very quick to figure out how to work, um, make it work and, and make a what seems like a pretty and, you know, professional video. Um, and then the team collectively reviewed, revised the video. Um, so the video is about eight minutes, as I said. Um, it includes clips from about 18 different writers. And um, we have posted it to YouTube. You could search for it. Um, I don't know exactly how you would find it by searching for it, but uh, leadership, uh, Charlottesville, perhaps, um, transit, transportation. Um, and there's uh, also we have a lot of raw footage that uh, we've made available to uh, community leaders. So we, we did share the presentation already with um, this body called the Regional Transit Partnership way back in February 27, uh, 27th, um, before, before the coronavirus really hit locally. Um, so the participants at the meeting, these are elected officials, these are leaders of CAT, et cetera. Um, I think it was received pretty well. Um, the uh, folks there said that they would be sharing the video with their staff. Um, we are working to continue to disseminate the video as much as we can with, with the local professionals that are making decisions. 
And very recently, the CEO of Jaunt, Brad Sheffield, um, asked to use the video as part of an application for a grant that Jaunt is doing. Um, so with that, I am going to see if I can switch screens to show you the video. Um, struggling here. Okay, here we are. I'm riding the bus because I don't have a driver's license. I don't drive. So we need public transportation. You currently don't have a car. You're working on getting one. We're going to the hospital. I work at UVA at the hospital, so there's no parking. <laughs> so it's a lot easier to ride public transport instead of just picking it up. Uh, this is just a really good way for me to get back and forth to work and from home, you know, so. Um, and it drives me basically right up to my job. It just makes a whole lot of sense. And I'm used to riding the transit from New York, so it makes sense. Well, I'm similar but opposite. I'm, I'm new to the transit, uh, but I get on the bus in Crozet and get off at my job, and it's very convenient and has a lot of cost savings. So I'm just, uh, I'm a UVA student, and I'm riding back to the grounds, yeah. I ride the bus today because uh, April the 10th, I was sure, I was sure my motorcycle, I got hit. It's fairly reliable, and it takes me where I need to go. I feel more safe when I'm riding the bus, and when I drive, or, or when I'm driving with somebody else, riding with somebody else, so. Uh, they all seem to, they, they love the bus, and um, you know, they, a lot of them definitely rely on it, and uh, they say the bus is, you know, saving them you know, gas money, uh, wear and tear on their vehicles. Uh, or that it's a, um, um, a valuable service, that, that it, um, it helps people all, um, as far as parking, not having to park. Yeah. But when I get on the Park Connect bus, I pull out my phone, I immediately start going through my email, break out my laptop. So it does give me a chance to meet with other people and, and cross-pollinate ideas with Más tarde, pasan retirado de tiempo, o sea, pasan muy tarde. Y solo es uno el que llega a la quinta, solo es uno. ¿Listo? Uh -huh. Pasa 45 minutos cada, cada 45 minutos. Sí. Extend out towards Afton, I suppose that's what direction. Okay. And out towards the airport. Oh, and the route can sometimes you might be waiting a while in between buses. Uh, sometimes I guess they get off track or whatever. I don't like that part of it, especially when you have a destination to go to and you're trying to get there in a timely fashion. Yeah, the bus is on. Sometimes sometime they on time and sometimes they on. Potentially more schedules and having things run on Sundays. Now, on this line, Sorry. on this line, we don't have no public transportation. On Sundays, we can't get around. Just like on Sundays, people have to get to work. Yes. And they don't have buses until tomorrow. Well, the improvements for the bus um, would be uh, on a Sunday. A Saturday, because when buses doesn't run, but I still have to go places and stuff. It would be nicer to be a little later, to run a little later. <laughs> um, so I actually use the cat app. Um, to, to look at like you know when the bus comes and I feel like that um, you know the fact that it exists is great but um, I think that it could be improved significantly um, first of all like the user interface is kind of unfriendly um, like the map is you know 
if you compare it to Google Maps, uh, of course, I'm not going to say like it should be, you know, really like the same you know, level of kind of user friendliness, but it's like the map, you can't really twist the map. You can't um, plot paths. So like if I have trouble finding the, the bus stop, um, you know, I might, I might not be able to do so that easily. You use the older version because the new version does not work. Very oh. Well. oh that's it doesn't show you. It doesn't show you where the bus is. So he walks to work every day because okay. there's no transportation past um, in his neighborhood in Woodbrook. So, so he has walks. to walk to the mall every day and then walk home at night if we don't give him a ride. And then for his doctor's appointments, he doesn't have transportation all the way to Fontaine Avenue. So he gets dropped off at the closest bus stop and then he has to walk from there to Fontaine and then walk from Fontaine back to catch the bus. Now in the evenings going back, I take Park Connect back, they would drop me off at Refner. There's only two minutes between mm -hmm. being dropped off and getting across the street by the garage, the central garage, to catch Crozet Lou Beast. Okay. And it never makes it. Or I guess. Yeah, if you have like a little overhead or to catch some weather, you don't mind getting the bus on bad days or if something happens and there's snow that comes down. You have some kind of protection there while you're waiting on Maybe a couple of the stops are kind of out in the open. Mm -hmm. um, and then another thing they need to do, where I'm from, the bus terminal is the old mall all night. So you close the bus terminal at 8 o'clock. At 8 o'clock. The people sit out here in the cold waiting on the bus. They need to keep it up till 11 o'clock when the bus is stopping running. I mean, I, I think that they need to talk to their customers, go straight to your source, ask them what they want. Okay. You know, talk to them, do a survey, ask them when they get on the bus, ask them when they get off the bus, put somebody on the bus that's doing surveys. If they're on there for an hour or 30 minutes, then they got plenty of time to answer a few questions. Like, go to your customer base and ask them what they want from their bus service. Well, what I like about riding your bus because most of the drivers that I've encountered for the last year, it's been very kind. Uh, they stop, uh, they're the actual way to get out the bus, would you like some help? Uh, they're great bus drivers, and they, they deserve a lot more appreciation than what they get. Um, overall, I think the bus drivers are very nice. Um, sometimes um, they're very convenient. Um, the drivers are great, they're fantastic. If they see you, they'll even stop to see if you're going to get the bus. I'm going to tell all the bus drivers, and everybody that's behind the scenes, uh, other than driving the bus, that is greatly appreciated in Charlottesville. And I thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Have a great Can you help us? Great, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Um, with that, I think we'll just open it up for questions. And if I didn't say anything that uh, the group wants to say, I guess this is now the time too. Any questions for the bus stops? Yeah, I have one. Um, um, what was your most challenging um, part of the presentation, well, not the presentation, but actually, you know, doing your filming and going out there and finding the people. Um, did you get any pushback from people who didn't want to be filmed? Um, yes. We did, yes. Does anybody else want to answer that question since I spoke so much? Um, I'll take it. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, we split up in sections, so we had different groups tackle different areas of the city, and um, so Yes, we did have some pushback, but I don't think as much as we thought we might. Um, 
we had a lot of people that were, you know, very willing to talk. Sometimes it was on a time schedule, right? So they were waiting for the bus. And so they wanted to, you know, go ahead and, and do their thing. And some people just were not comfortable. Um, so that was, that was fine too. Yeah, y'all did a great job. I liked it a lot. It was very, it, it, brought, it, it pulled me into it. And I really, I, I have an appreciation for that. So thank you for doing that, doing a great job on it. And thank well, Ty, you. Thanks, Ty. Ty gave us a lot of advice on um, audio quality that we pretty quickly ignored or decided was too <laughs> hard for us. So sorry about that. No, nah, no, nah, nah, it was good. It was good. I was, I was into it. So thank you. We actually did try to follow some of Ty's suggestions, but because people were always in such a, such a hurry, we weren't able to do some of the things that, that Ty told us that we should do. Yeah, I agree with that too. A lot of people were nervous. And back when we got on a couple of buses, the people just, <laughs> they froze. They didn't want to talk. Someone put their hands up. They didn't want to be seen. And um, we didn't really, um, bus drivers as well. I think they felt a little threatened. One thing that I wanted to add to what Greg said in the presentation, um, the grant that Jaunt is applying for has to do with the app that they have worked up. So I just wanted to mention that. So they're utilizing our video to assist with that grant process. Nice. Bus stoppers, did you all actually ride the bus anywhere with the um, the riders? Yes. And was that your first time on a bus in a long time or? Uh, not me. <laughs> okay. No. You ride on the regular? Well, I wouldn't say that I ride on it, but we have buses at the research park. Oh. So uh, we did some of our interviews on those buses. Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll take one more question if anyone has it for the bus stops. And again, those team members are Cal Beasley, Daryl Byers, Kara Shanderson, Je no, Jean's not there, Greg Harper, Misty Parsons, Judy Pointer, Teresa Willis, and Henry Young. Thank you all. All right. Okay, moving on to our next group, our housing group, and they are Gwen Cassidy, Shalomith Gonzalez, Esley Saherndon, Treat Jackson, Ayana Marcus, Shaista Nizam, and Jessie Torrey. I accidentally put Jessie in the youth education, but she's actually in the housing team. And so I'm going to read um, a brief introduction before the housing team presents, and here we go. Charlottesville is a community in crisis when it comes to affordable housing. Much of the recent emphasis on dealing with this problem has focused on renters through participation in public housing programs. In order to create a holistic understanding of affordable housing in Charlottesville, the team worked to focus on two aspects of the legacy project, one of which will include an artistic piece, a brief snapshot of the context of equitable housing in Charlottesville. It highlights the stories of two homeowners and a local employer who has assisted her employees in purchasing a home. The artistic piece is followed up by an outline of the Gospel Hill Employee Assisted Home Buyer Legacy Project. There are currently no formal employee assisted home buyer or EAH programs in Charlottesville and relatively few first time home buyer assistant programs currently operating. The Gospel Hill EAH Legacy Project seeks to increase home ownership in Charlottesville through a partnership between UVA, other employers, and the city to help support low and moderate income workers purchase a home. The housing team acknowledged that many leaders are thinking about what's next in this new world and the economic impact of COVID-19 while learning how to pivot their businesses. But believe that the time has never been better to toss out the rule book, to stop maintaining the status quo and to truly invest in people. It's understandable to feel overwhelmed and a sense of scarcity, but not to give in to perceive the limitations to limit one from doing the right thing. Employers must lead by doing the right thing for business and their business will grow. The team selected UVA to ignite the program because of its housing legacy within the city of Charlottesville and being the city's largest employer. So I now turn it over to our housing team. Thank you, Andrea. Um, this is Ayana Marcus and I'll be sharing my screen for the artistic portion.
and there will be no narration, it will just play. And they give you a, what would I, what would I say, um, fool's goal to think that you're going to something better, to get your eye, your focus off of, okay, y'all built this neighborhood up from nothing. Because, see, I researched Gospel Hill. They came and um, met with my grandmother. Like I said, she had third grade education. They only gave her $6,800. Uh, probably about an eight and a half. They told her, oh, if you don't let us have it for this six to eight hundred dollars, we'll take you to court, and um, we're probably gonna give you three thousand, give you less than what we offer. But she didn't know that she had the right to say no. The university, when you're in a room, the university is at eight hundred pounds gorilla sitting down. This thing been in my chest for forty years. So in our neighborhood, what they took away from us was just the community, you know, just being able, knowing everybody, and if somebody needed help, you help them or whatever, and they spread us out everywhere. And you know, in Charleston City, Charleston, now, there aren't any more black neighborhoods. And so your condo experience, how has it been for you? When I first got there, it was not good at all. Okay. It was not good at all. I actually, my, the guy I was dating at the time, he was going to take the money and get a lawyer because they were harassing us because they didn't want black people over there. Wow. It's a very older community. So I'm going to say 96% of their community is retired. And at that time, there were no black people there. Wow. None. We were, and we were young, black. And this was and in the early 2000s. This was the early 2000s. I don't know how many employees I helped, but everything from a, a loan to buy a car to uh, mortgages and um, down payment loans. And so I, I worked with the employees that didn't understand the financial uh, world and, and how you dealt with that to purchase a home or um Saw a lot of people who I felt were being mistreated. I was blessed by a business that brought in a lot of money um, and I didn't need it all. Yeah. So it's best to help others. So um, India, uh, I came to know you through a conversation about, I came to know about your home buying process through a conversation I had with you about purchasing your home and you let me know that your employer was a 
pivotal part of that. Can you tell me who you were working for at the time? I was working for Dr. Dumper Bryant at Human Gen Pipettes. And at Human Gen Pipettes, what was the time and span that you worked for them? My total time there was yeah. 16 years. So again, <laughs> Dr. Bryant had a condominium that she used for rental usage for one of her associates that would visit two, three times a month. Uh, she offered, um, in the interest of your child's education, to let you rent that condo um, in, a, in, in what she perceived to be a better school system for your child because she was wanted your child to have something better. And she let you move into that apartment. Um, did you have to pay any down payment? I did not. Um, I did not. Was your rent comparable to what you were paying or was there an increase in rent? No. There was no increase no. in rent? And lastly, you said the money that you paid her monthly, she used that she used towards, towards your down payment. Towards, putting it towards the mortgage. Putting it towards the mortgage, for which at the time that you moved in, you I had no, no intention or idea I that, I that that was back. being offered. No. Wow. Um, and so how long have you been in? Your I've room? been in that condo, um, hi, 17 years maybe? That is the conclusion of the artistic piece. Thank you, Ayana. Can everybody see my screen and hear me clearly? I see some heads being nodded. Moving forward from Ayana's piece, we wanted to set the history, the previous legacy of the relationship of the city and the university and move forward with a proposal of a home ownership program. My screen, let me see. Where you're, my um, the people are blocking my screen, so I'm trying to adjust it. Our proposed project is called Gospel Hill E A H Legacy Program. E A H stands for the Employee Assisted Home Buyers Program, offering a pathway to home ownership. Our mission and our vision to empower families by creating a pathway towards home ownership and/or identification and or out of generational poverty as a result of historical wealth inequality. The vision is to create a community where everyone, every working family can find a stable, safe, and decent place to call home. The project overview would include a five-year partnership commitment, UVA Funding Foundation Initiative, and UVA Financial Literacy Initiative thus making sure that the program has time to grow with the five years and UVA commits to funding the project and the financial piece, ensuring that the participants understand the financial piece of it as well and are prepared to become homeowners, thus creating a legacy of opportunity. The financial support, UVA Foundation, Funding Foundation would invest five half a million dollars, $500,000 over the next five years to help 50 local families aspire to home ownerships with a down payment assistance grant. This is not a loan that they have to worry about paying back, but a grant. 
The investment will assist families in the Charlottesville area with up to $10,000 per home buyers for down payment assistance. And we say up to 10,000 because some families may not need that, that amount, but it would go up to a commitment of a, a $100,000 per year for next five years, impacting 10 families per year. We see this as a small investment considering the previous history and the ongoing housing crisis that Charlottesville is currently in. Impact funding. This is a more descriptive way of understanding the funding. The funding would be granted directly to a fund administrator to manage and dispense to families. Funds may be either released as a lump sum grant for the entire amount or fund administrator may require funds in, in a lump sum of $10,000 increments as families are selected into the program. At the time of the closing, the, the $10,000 will be applied towards the down payment of the home purchase. So there would be no waiting, it would be applied immediately. Once the beneficiary purchase a home, the grant may be tied to a home deed with, with a clawback provision, meaning to help support the program going forward if the homeowner decides to sell the home prior to a five years, 100% of the fund would be paid back to the UVA Foundation. That is a, a safeguard in there and it ensures that the homeowner truly understands that the goal is for them to remain in the home. UVA's Financial Literacy Initiative and the Eligibility Requirements. The participants would agree to enroll in approved home buyers program and post training support while remaining in good standings throughout the course. Families income would range from 25 to 45 percent of AMI towards housing, meaning this percentage is what they would what they currently pay towards housing, either 25 to 45 percent of their income goes towards housing. That's one of the criteria. Homeown um, household members must be employed by UVA. And the comprehensive regional housing study and needs assessment, which is a recent report done by the Thomas Jefferson Planning District. The report was released in early April, just last month, discussing a number of issues that affect housing affordability, including housing supply, funding, income, and discrimination. So it's truly an issue and continues to be an issue today. Dan Rosenwig, President and CEO of Habitat for Humanities of Greater Charlottesville and Sunshine Meth and CEO of Piedmont Housing Alliance were both quoted, there is no silver bullet to the issues. The only way, work together and remain committed collectively. Yes, there is no silver bullet to solve this housing crisis, but let's be inspired and add measurable opportunities for those disproportionately impacted. We can make a difference. This is a bold vision, but we want to see change and we can be about the change. This proposal directly relates to one of the of President Ryan's strategic initiative to strengthen the university's relationship with the Charlottesville community and determine the highest priority issues for consideration, which includes wages, housing to improve over the next five years. This fits directly with his plan. It drops right on into the five-year plan. Affordable workforce housing is one of the top areas of focus for UVA and community leaders. We ask that UVA and other employers continue to consider all possible solutions for addressing the affordable housing crisis. Yes, we realize that this is a bold undertaking, but in these times that we are faced in, we must take bold steps and not be limited by the past, but look forward to making a difference in the people who have been committed time and time again. It's time for employers to step up and we'd like to, to have this kicked off by UVA. That concludes our presentation. Any questions? Yeah, I'm gonna, next screen. 
I've got a couple of questions. And I would like to say that we had a lot more, but we were trying to be very conscious of time, which is why we had Andrea um, read our narrative in the very beginning. And I did provide her with um, a sheet detailing the very specifics of the program, because we weren't aware of if we'd run over. Alex, you had a question? Alex, yeah, yeah. yeah um... First of all, thanks for the, the uh, recommendation. I think the partnership aspect is very important. And then uh, most importantly, the reference to employer-sponsored uh, uh, housing program. Uh, I think uh, that program is overdue here in Charlottesville, in particular uh, with reference to UVA. Um, I was wondering why, why the, the down payment recommendation for the grant is only $10,000, I thought. 10,000 is a little bit uh, too small for, for a grant, you know, for down payment assistance. You know, is there any thoughts, you know, uh, that went into that uh, for you guys to uh, um, ha have such a low limit for down payment assistance? Um, Alec, I'm trying to fix my screen, but that's just a conversation starter. Um, okay. It's to get you get us in the door to start the conversation. A lot of times when you start high, people just automatically shut you down. But I have worked with other um, programs and generally they're under $10,000. So we thought that we were being pretty ambitious to even come up with that. A lot of um, programs, grants will give you up from 3,000 to 5,000. The highest I've seen is 8,000. But typically in the Charlottesville area, it's about um, 5,000. All right. Um, and we, uh, go ahead. But we know that, um, well, I know that the city is, um, was working on a similar program for itself. And um, at the bottom of one of the documents that I sent over to um, Andrea, we are open to working with the city and um, to help you recreate or, or adjust the program that you all were working on because I know that um, you all had some issues with getting y'alls off the ground and I think that ours may be a little more detailed oriented than what you all had or uh, we can work together and partner to make um, it work. Amen the to that. Yeah, the other question is uh, um, uh, in terms of employer sponsored uh, housing, um, is this going to be focused on a UVA uh, faculty, uh, low income um, uh, uh, workers, or, or is it going to be a community wide uh, project? That's a great question. And we were starting off with um, UVA employees, but um, considering what President Ryan said his he wanted his initiative to be, we were leaving that open for him to broaden it out to the community. We would love to see it go beyond the uh, UVA staff because if you notice the connection of the word gospel heal um, in Ayana's piece in the beginning, that affected, gospel heal affected the whole community. When um, UVA um, purchased that, purchased those lots from the basically African-American communities to build their new um, hospital. So it would be great to have this program go out into the community, but we needed a starting point. So this was the starting point. Okay, and then uh, my, my final question, and then I'll shut up. Um, no, you're fine. And anybody else on our team is more than welcome to jump in. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, this how, is the last question for this, this team. Okay, Alex. Okay, uh, 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 how receptive is UVA? Uh, to the um, to the program during your discussion, we have um, actually gone. There was members on our, our team that went out and did. We wanted to make sure that there was a, a desire for it, so we went and talked to some of the uh, the students that are employed, and then some of the staff to see whether or not they were interested in the program. And a lot of people are very interested and wanted to learn more about the program. Um, a lot of UVA um, from a lot of, we invited a lot of UVA members that are decision makers to this presentation 
and have reached out to them but have not received a response yet. We realize that this is a bold undertaking and we are committed to the challenge. We're not giving up simply because we haven't received a response yet. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Thanks. You're welcome, Alex. Okay, and, and to, there was one question in the chat box that I think we should get to. Kristen asks, is this just reserved for first time home buyers? Good question. At this point, it is. Okay. All right, our affordable housing team, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that presentation. All right. Lastly, we have the all right, community resources team, and they are Taylor Everett, Marsha Fisher, Don Giannagelli. I know I didn't say that right, Don. Sorry. Don G. Russell Cruz, Caitlin Marcotte, Lachine Parks, Christian Patricia, Zoe Smith, and Susan Thomas. So, no, not Zoe. Zoe. Where's my Zoe? Where are you, Zoe? You're on the housing, the housing team. team. <laughs> okay, I'm pulling from, a, from an old list. Sorry, Zoe and Jesse. Please forgive me for that. All right, and Susan Thomas. Okay, mm -hmm. all right, so we will turn it over to the community resources team, Susan Thomas. Right, okay. Um, as soon as my screen gets, oh, there we go. Um, Okay, um, we're doing this together. So Don will take the first part. Our team was extremely ambitious and worked on two projects. Don? Yes, we did, thank you. So um, our team was, was trying to address uh, the question of resources available in our community to help people just improve their incomes. And that wound up following uh, two different tracks in sequence. We started off partnering with the city of Charlottesville on a, a program that they're getting off the ground called Mecca. It's for mentoring entrepreneurs in the Charlottesville area. And it's, it's geared towards folks that are trying to um, improve their income stream to, to get away from being wage earners and instead just start something on their own, use their creativity to, to build a business and, and advance in that way. And, what we wound up doing with the, uh, with the city is we did some foundational brainstorming about it, defining the different kinds of entrepreneurs that this could support. And we found out that really it's, it's gonna be available to a whole slew of folks, people that have already made an attempt to start a business and are looking for ways to improve it. And also folks that just have an idea and they're wondering how to get started. So next slide, Susan. The MECA program is something that's going to be part of the city's Go Startup initiative. And it's going to be a program that's required for Go Startup, but also available to folks outside that program. It's meant to be six weeks of uh, structured mentoring sessions between chamber member uh, business owners and folks looking to start and grow their businesses. And what we provided, next slide, to this program is um, we, we wrote the discussion guides that will be the starting point for those six weeks of, of mentoring sessions between future uh, or young entrepreneur and, uh, and their mentor, starting with the formation of ideas, the basics of business planning, how to do the market research related to who your competition is and, and how you're going to distinguish yourself in order to attract business, defining that mission and vision for the business, and then going through what are the nuts and bolts, the operational expenses that you have to deal with and how you're, you're gonna turn a profit. And then finally, articulating the concept. The last week is about the elevator speech that you might give if you have 10 seconds to tell someone what you do and why you love it and why they should be your client. So we did that and we also came up with surveys that can be used at the end of each six week program to help uh, develop its trajectory for the future. Um, round about late December, we, uh, we wound up switching gears. We, we had uh, a situation where the MECA program was accelerating, thankfully, faster than we could keep up with it. And uh, they were running with our ideas, so we switched to another project to, uh, to help a little bit more. 
And Susan's going to tell us about that. We worked with Network to Work. Great. And so Network to Work is an established program that links distant advantaged job seekers with jobs. And the way it works is that there are literally hundreds, over 300 connectors in the, the yeah, localities that you see on the screen that know people that are in need of job or need some support to become self-sufficient. Uh, they identify the job seekers and help them get started. And every job seeker needs a supportive pathway to help them um, get where they need to go. So I've done some interviewing um, with some of the folks that were at the program. And it was a practice interview, getting them ready for a job interview. And also, as we began learning more about the program, some of our team members talked with some of the connectors to find out what some of the challenges are so that we could better understand how important it was for us to become involved and remain involved and help find these connectors. For example, we found that sometimes a person did not have any, uh, an appropriate professional dress for an interview. Um, we also learned that one person didn't show up at an interview because he didn't have any shoes to wear and was very um, embarrassed about it. We found that another one um, didn't have childcare. Um, I, when I was working um, with the group that we were doing um, the practice interviews, one person didn't show. And so I did find out later that her child um, had become ill and she had no way to notify anybody. So then we rescheduled. So um, with the, um, the kinds of work that we're going to be doing, our community outreach team, we say what well, we're the rescue team because some of the things that we're going to be doing is help launch the navigator program. So the connector works within their community to identify a job seeker and then works with the staff at PVCC, um, the Network to Work team, to populate a remind application. And that's very appropriately named because it reminds the person of what the next steps are, um, what the Network to Work program does to start working with the connector is have a very extensive survey of 93 questions. And as Frank Scalacci, who's the head of the program said, we can ask questions that employers can't to find out exactly what is needed. For instance, are they previously a felon? What are some of the other challenges so that we know better how to support them? Yes, there are a fair number of former fellows in the program who very successfully have, have uh, gotten jobs. Um, the Remind is um, a relatively new application and one of the tasks that I was going to do before COVID came was help them with some user acceptance testing. This is what I did in, um, when I worked for IBM and so it's very comfortable uh, basically trying to break the program, trying to see how it worked. Well, that's kind of where we are yet because they were still making um, adaptations and changes when the program um, shut down. We are also um, looking to, rec um, to recruit um, navigators and our team was successful before things got shut down in identifying um, 10 people. Um, the team members recruited colleagues. We presented at a Rotary Club um, we got two more Rotary Clubs to go once we know when things are going to start. But we had a lot of interest in the program and um, they're looking forward um, to the program starting again. So although LC has ended, we have committed to Frank to continue working with them to first our team will learn to use Remind. Um, and then we will develop navigator training. There is currently some connector training, and so we'll leverage some of that 
Um, I have a background as an instructional designer, so I will be um, working very closely with um, Frank. And so we, once we learn to use Remind, get the training done, then we will be very actively recruiting um, the navigators. So the specific work streams that are ongoing um, is creating and launching a pilot test of the materials that we will be creating and then identifying areas of improvement and making recommendations for redoing the materials. Um, we're investigating ways or what's the best, best way. Are we going to have some virtual training? Are we going to have materials to uh, support? Is there a way that we can embed some training into the Remind app? So we're exploring um, these activities. But as I said, the program is on hold right now um, until we can get into uh, times we're not having so much social distancing. Um, we're also um, committed to help with marketing. And so we are um, planning to create and launch a marketing plan. We'll do this in, conjun in conjunction with Frank and his team, and then continue actively rec um, recruiting volunteers. And we um, are looking to this. And that's our first piece of marketing materials. Um, Frank is absolutely delighted with the video and we plan to uh, create other marketing materials once we can get back together. So we welcome questions. We have, uh, our team has been very involved and we, we still have calls every once in a while just to check on each other. And we're looking forward to having a, a barbecue party when we're allowed to. So questions welcome. Susan, we didn't hear the video, but if there's another member of your team that has it, that can play it with sound, I'll, I'll allot that. But in the meantime, uh, if you have questions for Susan and, and the community resources team, please please go ahead and ask. Uh, okay, the, just let there, me ask. The, there, there wasn't any, uh, any words or anything in the sound. It, it was just a very peppy, uh, music piece that went along with okay with the character so right and actually then i did something wrong because um don and his wife sam were working with me last night to get the peppy music um so I okay but we, we could still read it so that was <laughs> okay oh, i'm sorry because the music was so fun i'm sorry and i even yeah i'm okay it's, but questions it's okay it's all right um any questions for this team 
All right. Okay, Robert asks, in what way is the first program different? Rob, is this for this current team? Rob Gray? The first, the first part of it, which was talking about Mecca. Um, okay. yeah, yeah, I think I share Rob's uh, thoughts and just wonder, is, is the first program meant to be um, a way to give more resources to uh, burgeoning entrepreneurs? And if so, um, did the team look into all of the different mi micro entrepreneur groups in the Charlottesville area, such as CIC and SBDC? We, we did look at some of those, yes. What, uh, what the city's economic development office is doing is, is launching um, something of their own, and they've got an independent funding stream for it that's, that, that's, that's meant to, uh, to just target folks inside the city specifically. Zoe's on the call, so let's pull her in because she actually works with the Office of Economic Development. And did you want to answer Rob's? And Lee's question, Zoe? Yeah, so we've actually been um, working with CIC. This is gonna be like a precursor to CIC's program. So what we've heard is that um, a lot of the, you know, the, the lingo that they use can really go over like an entry level entrepreneur's head. So we're trying to do something that's really um, entry level and grassroots so that they could transition into CIC. Okay. You're much better at that than me, Zoe. Thank you so much. <laughs> a lot of networking and collaboration going on, so that's good. Any other questions for, for this team? Okay. All right, so let's go back to one more question that Daniel had for the housing team. Now, there's a lot of communications going on in the chat box, so Daniel, can you ask your question? And then we're going to we're going to uh, wrap up the the program today. Well, Zimmer, yeah, in, um, in the of responding to Daniel. Cool. Um, so I was asking basically um, how many houses in the Charlottesville area are kind of fit this criteria, because um, both being an employee of UVA formally and then also being a new homeowner, I know that there is a very small market of houses that are below I'd say 200 maybe 220 but then making an income of around 60 a little bit above that in order to have your income be basically only your mortgage payment to be only 45 percent of your income every month um, it's just kind of a small window and I know that UVA salaries are available online and there are just very few people that make that, that maybe aren't professors or a lot of people live outside of Charlottesville. Um, and so I just wanted to know like if you all had done any research or had found any um, basically numbers as to how many houses are available that fit what you're looking for. Can I respond to that? Did somebody say something? Tree. Yes. Um, Lisa probably will have the numbers on how many houses that will fit into, but I did respond to it in the chat. And um, while, while it is very true that it's hard to meet uh, the criteria to meet that, but most earners, at, most earners that are UV employees are not single earners and they have additional resources. There are, uh, most of these people, um, they're, they're going to, if they, they are living in group and generational families together. They're all living and they're all paying rent already. And market rate rent is definitely still more than most people would pay for a normal mortgage. If everybody is in the home and everybody has a stake in the game, everybody needs to have a stake in being part of home ownership. And yes, UVA employees are open to this program and that's great and that's gonna help them along the way, but they still have to meet normal income to debt ratios and they still have to be viable candidates to be home buyers. Does that answer the question as to? Right, I, I definitely agree that there are a lot of people, like I have a roommate and he helps with paying my mortgage, but I also know that there, he is not on the mortgage, like I am the only person that's on the mortgage. And so even though there may be generational people that are inside of the home that are helping to pay, they all can't be assigned to the same mortgage. Um, you know what I mean? 
why can't they? I, I mean, is that, is that a part of the program? Is, I, I don't know. I, I guess I just didn't see that part. Part, the, part of the program is the part of the program is that in order to receive the funds, you have to be a UVA employee. It doesn't say that everyone has to be a UVA employee that's going to be part of a home purchase or that's going to be part of um, that's going to be facilitated in the home. Okay. And just in general, anybody can be a part of a mortgage. I mean, you can have multiple people be a part of a mortgage. I've had mortgages. I mean, I don't write mortgages, but I've had, um, like Treat said, there were there are generational uh, members, more than one different generation and families, and they come together and purchase a home. More than one can be on a mortgage. Um, and in terms of uh, stats, um, numbers change every day. And in terms of the homes that are available in the city, we would partner with the city and UVA, other employees. And sometimes when you want to purchase a home, you got to be realistic in, in what's available. And sometimes it may require you fixing up a home. I have sold homes in the Charlottesville area very recently to, um, I don't know if she's on this call or not, but um, she actually works in the housing industry, helping to find homes for, um, low income families and we struggled a little to get her a home but we were able to find her a home it's a home that she'll need to fix up and sometimes we need to adjust people's expectations but there are homes out there and if you're with the right individual to help you find a home you can get on a home but part of this program like treat said reinforcing what treat says there is a literacy component to this just because you're having a certain wage you have to still qualify your debt income racials must match up. It's not, we're just not throwing individuals in homes and not wanting them to be successful. There is also a follow-up um, program that they need to be a part of to make sure they are successful and they understand that they need to save. I mean, they're already, like Treat said, they're already in a rental situation and most of them are paying enough to uh, afford a mortgage. It's just making sure that they go through the process, get the support that they need, and take the time to find the proper home. Okay. All right. Thank you all. Somebody said it. Corinne said it. We did it. You did it. So congratulations. All right. Bef before I um, have Bill give some closing words on behalf of LCAA, I do want to make you all aware that we will be presenting you with these certificates. There's Taylor. Hey, Taylor and a nice little maggot that you can put somewhere and show that you're a graduate of Leadership Charlottesville class of 2020. Yay. The uh, Leadership Charlottesville Alumni Association and I, we're gonna work together to make sure we connect with each of you to get these to you. And this is what I would normally do if we did this in person. So I'm going to call each person's name. So turn on your videos and make sure you say hi when I call your name, all right? Cue the pomp and circumstance music, all right? <laughs> all right, Taylor Averick with Jamie Whitehouse, Jamie White, White House, Jamie White Real Estate. Say hi, Taylor, where are you? Okay, hey, Taylor. All hey. right, Titus Cal Beasley with CFA Institute. Hey, Daryl Byers with Albemarle County Police Department. Daryl. Hey, okay. Gwendolyn Cassidy with Managing Projects. Kara Shandison with Ting. Ting. <laughs> All right. Ty Cooper with Life View Marketing and Visuals. Hello. Hey, Cooper. Daniel Fairley the second, City of Charlottesville, Alliance for Black Male Achievement. Marsha Fisher, University of Marsha uh, Fisher, University of Virginia Community Credit Union. Hello. Don G. Edward Jones. Hey Don. Hi, everybody. Corinne Giller, <laughs> Mickey Hamlet, Attorneys at Law. Ooh. Shaloma Hi. Gonzalez, R. E. Lee Companies, Incorporated. Hi. All right, y'all. Robert Gray, Dreaming Diamonds, LLC. Greg Harper, County of Albemarle. Hey, everybody. S. Lisa Herndon, Keller Williams Alliance. Treat Jackson, 
the Tax Ladies, Inc., Russell Cruz, Hello. Royal Caravanis, Caitlin Marcotte, City of Charlottesville, Parks and Recreation, Ayana Marcus, Charlottesville Area Community Foundation, Richard Needham, Claiborne Education. Congratulations, everyone. Shaista Nizam, Omni Charlottesville Hotel, Lachine Parks, City of Charlottesville Communications, Misty Parsons, University of Virginia Foundation. Hello. Christian Patricia, Skeen Law Offices, Judy Jones Pointer, UVA School of Medicine, David Puckett, Albemarle County Fire Rescue, Arthur Rogers, Martin Horn Inc., Jimmy Rowland, yes. hey, Great Eastern Management <laughs> Company, Derek Rush, Thank you. Steel Property Group, Zoe Smith, City of Charlottesville, Yo. Office of Economic <laughs> Development, Susan Reed, who's retired from IBM Global Consulting, Jesse Torrey, Whole Woman's Health Alliance, Patton Usry, Miller School of Albemarle, Teresa Willis, Piedmont Virginia Community College, and Henry, Henry Young with Scott Croner. So Thank you, you can turn your, your audio on and just clap everybody, celebrate. Woo! So proud of you all. So, so proud of you. We did it. Yes, you did. And you, you put a lot of work into um, the, the work on the front end during the fall semester and with your projects, which you started in October. So congratulations. You all are, are wonderful. And this will be one for the book. So before we go, Bill Brent, you ready? I'm ready. All right, so real quickly, let them know what's next as a Leadership Charlottesville graduate. Absolutely, congratulations. First off, class of 2020, uh, first to officially congratulate you um, as the immediate past board chair for Leadership Charlottesville Alumni Association to welcome you officially to the Leadership Charlottesville Alumni Association, yay. Um, we look forward to your continued incredible work in the community and the goal of the Alumni Association is to provide that platform that we can continue to partner together as, as leaders um, as part of this program uh, and the Alumni Association is over a thousand people strong as of last year. So wow. you, are, you are joining an, an incredible Alumni Association. We welcome you to it and we look forward to our continued partnership together. So thank you. And I want to recognize the board members that are on the call. I believe I saw Scott. Scott, you're on the call? Okay, he might have had that. To, Congrats, to, everyone. Yes, yeah, Scott's on the call. Scott, Will Crutchfield. Yes, congratulations, everyone. And uh, Kim was on the call earlier. She, she um, congratulated you all. Keith O'Neill. Keith's here, yep. Hey, Keith. Am I missing anyone else? And David, the board, the board chair, here. sends his congratulations. All right. So um, let me see if Elizabeth is still on the call. If not, I know she has a meeting to go to. Okay. No, no, I am here. I just want to say thanks. Okay. I, I really right, enjoyed all the sessions. Right, and um, if, I, if I didn't say it earlier, uh, on behalf of the chamber, I want to thank Andrea for a tremendous dedication to this uh, important cause. So thank you, Andrea. And congrats, everybody. Very exciting. All right. Thank you all, and thank you for your wonderful comments. I'm going to leave the call on. I'm going to stop the recording. So if you all want to hang out a little bit afterwards, help yourself.